Good afternoon, everyone. If we could take our seats, please, we're going to get started. Thank you all for being here today at the Montclair Public Library. My name is Peter Coyle, and I'm the library director, and we're glad to have you here for this Open Book, Open Mind event. Our Open Book, Open Mind series is funded through the generosity of the Montclair Public Library Foundation through its donors, as well as the grants from the Montclair Foundation and Investors Foundation. We express sincere appreciation to those who give generously to support our programs and services. We'd also like to thank Watchroom Booksellers for handling the logistics of the book sales. Uh, they will be selling Dr. Perry's book books in the hallway afterwards, which she'll be signing. Um, our event tonight would not be possible without the help of our Open, bu open Book, Open Mind Advisory Board, especially Abby West and Rachel Swarms, who helped uh, plan this event. So we appreciate their efforts in making this program happen. On your seat, there is a flyer announcing two of our uh, upcoming Open Book, Open Mind conversations. Sunday, February 25th, uh, Charlotte Alter will be speaking, and her book was just on the cover of Time Magazine, so we know that that will be a very interesting conversation. And then Sunday, March 1st, Gail Collins will be here to kick off our celebration of Women's History Month. She'll be discussing her newest book, No Stopping Us Now, and she'll be in conversation with Dale Rusakoff. On the other side of the flyer is a listing of some of our African American history programs for this month, and I'd like to draw your particular attention to our program with artist Willie Cole, who will be in conversation with, with Nettie Forn Thomas on February 24th. And some of his work is here in display at the library by the circulation desk, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that and then come to that event. Um, and before we start our program this afternoon, uh, raise your hand if you have a cell phone. Raise your hand if you have a cell phone. Raise your hand if you've turned it off, please, or put it to silent. And if you think you have, you could double check one more time. We would really appreciate it. Um, and uh, we will, at the end of this program, have a, a question and answer period, and we'll have a microphone. So if you could wait, f wait to hold your questions until that period of time and use a microphone, we would appreciate that. To introduce our speakers this evening, I'd like to have our uh, chair of the Montclair Public Library Foundation, Jonathan Simon, uh, come up to do that. And he's gonna introduce our, our speakers and get the program started. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Peter. Uh, happy Black History Month, Montclair. Um, special shout outs, do we have any foundation board members in the house? I saw Jen Dore, do we have anyone else? Welcome, uh, Montclair Public Library trustees. Okay, uh, Open Book, Open Mind Advisory Board. If any of you are here, as Peter acknowledged you, thank you all for the hard work that you do in bringing us this great content. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, uh, and I just want to thank her for, you know, putting pen to paper and contributing this great work, not only to her sons, but to the world. I think it's a gift, and you will see exactly what I mean when she comes out. But before I invite her to join us, and Emily, who will be moderating the discussion, it wouldn't be Black History Month without a little trivia. So uh, since we're in the library, this is going to be literary trivia. Can you tell me which famous, don't use your phones, please. We gotta be honest, brokers here. Which famous female black author was born today, February 9th, 1944? Do, 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 do. Who? Look at that. All right, congratulations. You win a Montclair Public Library water bottle. Um, before I introduce our speakers as well, I want to just make a quick appeal. This programming, among others, are brought to you, as Peter said, by the work of the Montclair Public Library Foundation, which I am proud to chair. For all the taxpayers in the room, $87 out of each of your tax bills goes to support the library. If we only use that funding to support this institution, we'd have shorter hours, fewer programs, probably one open branch five days a week versus we have two open seven days a week. We see over 
uh, 51 people an hour. The average user that comes to the library comes 94 times in a year. We have had a 200% increase in the number of free hotspots that we've offered to folks in the community who need Wi-Fi access. And we've had 52% increase year over year in our customer engagement. If you don't believe me, all of this is written on this very handy giveaway for each of you. So as you think about your charitable giving, we know there are lots of causes and things to give to in this town of ours. We'd love for you to continue to think about the Montclair Public Library and the foundation so that we can bring more services to you and deliver great content. I also want to mention we provided over 2,300 classes and programs in 2019 through the library and through our adult school. And so now let's turn to why we're all here and let me introduce Dr. Amani Perry. And I was texting with her earlier and she said, please don't call me doctor, just call me Amani. So in the spirit of that, Amani is the author of Breathe, A Letter to My Sons. It, she is the Hughes Rogers Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University, where she also teaches, teaches in, the, in the law, public affairs, and gender and sexuality studies. She's a native of Birmingham, Alabama, and spent much of her life in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Chicago, and now resides outside of Philadelphia. She's the author of several books, including Looking for Lorraine, The Radiant and Radical Life of Lorraine Hansberry. She has a BA in American Studies and Literature uh, from Yale University. She's a PhD in American Civilizations from Harvard. She has a JD in, from Harvard Law, and if that were not enough, she has her Master of Laws from Georgetown University. Her latest book, Breathe, was a 2020 NAACP Image Award nominee for Outstanding Literary Work in Nonfiction. And it's on the best of list for Kirkus Review for Best Nonfiction Books of 2019 and the undefeated, undefeated 25 Can't Miss Books of 2019. In my opinion, Breathe is truly an inheritance and a transfer of knowledge in the spirit of James Baldwin, W.E. Du Bois, Toni Morrison, and Langston Hughes. Today, Imani will be discussing Breathe with Emily Rabateau, who's the author of The Professor's Daughter and Searching for Zion, named a best book of 2013 by the Huffington Post and the San Francisco Chronicle. She was also a finalist for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award grand prize winner of the New York Book Festival and a winner of the 2014 American Book Award. She teaches creative writing in Harlem at City College, once known as the Poor Man's Harvard. We are pleased to have both Emily and Amani joining us today. Thank you. Hello. I'm going to pour you some water. Hey, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm so delighted to have been invited to talk with Dr. Imani Perry tonight about this book, Breathe a Letter to My Sons. Um, I'll put this here. Okay. <laughs> So when I first heard about this book, I assumed that it was in the tradition of or um, inspired by James Baldwin, mm -hmm. um, his 1963 book, uh, The Fire Next Time, which was posed as a, a letter, um, a love letter, and also a letter of instruction to his namesake and nephew, um, James about what he could come to expect uh, as a black man in America and uh, how to protect himself. And um, I wondered if you could speak a little bit about that book's influence upon this book. Sure. And I felt it when I, when I reread the book, I, I felt it. But it's also its own, its mm -hmm. own book. It's a mother's book. Yeah, um, and that's a bit, well, oh, absolutely. Um, but I also want to say thank you so much for being in this conversation with me. Um, Emily is one of my favorite writers because she blends this kind of really serious, um, rigorous intellectual work with writing that has deep feeling in it and beauty. And so 
You're my ideal interlocutor, so thank you for being here. Um, and, and you're also a seeker. And in some sense, can you all hear me? No. Oh, I'm glad you told me. Let's see. What about now? Is that any better? OK. Um, so Baldwin. I mean, there's, there's always there's a series of books that have had a, have a direct um, impact on what I was trying to do. Certainly, The Fire Next Time is, is one of them. Also, um, W.E.B. Du Bois' Souls of Black Folk. And the book, in many ways, begins where he began with people asking him, how does it feel to be a problem in 1903? Mm -hmm. And my iteration of that was really being on the soccer field and having other parents ask me questions like, you know, oh, it must be so hard to raise a black child. And feeling incensed, actually, at that kind of intrusiveness, but feeling like this is a question that's been asked for over 100 years um, that's projected out instead of um, eliciting a kind of reflection on the person who would ask the question, which, you know, how does it feel to treat me as a problem, I might ask in, in response. Mm. Um, with, for the thing that, um, that Baldwin does in The Fire Next Time that was so, that's always been so profound for me is that part of what he says to his nephew is actually about helping him witness um, Baldwin's brother, his father, fully. Right, what he's had to endure in, in this life um, in order to have a kind of tenderness towards his, his interpretation of his father. And I kind of, I wanted to flip that mm -hmm. and think about what does it mean to write with a tenderness towards what it means to be a black child at the present moment. I, I am continuously thinking about how often we're getting, giving the messages that are unavoidable about, about danger, about how they're treated as a problem, about their vulnerability, about, and, and that, and, on, and not necessarily giving them comparable messages about their incredible beauty mm -hmm. and possibility, but also not necessarily being explicit about let me see, say it this way, like, so oftentimes there'll be instructions, right? Like, so if you, if, if you run into a police officer, do this or don't that, and don't do that, or dress this way, or perform, you know, be this kind of person to, when in fact, the world does not, the world is cruel to black children, irrespective of how they perform. And the, the message that I wanted to impart was much more about the tradition that they have to draw upon um, to give them some substance, some something to bolster, mm. um, to develop a sense of, of their, their value and, and grace in the face of all of that, mm -hmm. and, and the prospect of joy. Mm -hmm. And in that way, it also, like I read um, um, uh, The Fire Next Time and Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon as like companion books, because a lot of that book is about uh, an aunt teaching her nephew to be more fully human, right? right? And so it's sort of like, yeah, so there's these, a bunch of works that I, I sort of found myself, not just in conversation with, but I was like trying to kind of glean from them what to share, not just with my children, but really with everybody in yeah. this moment. Yeah, thank you. Um, after the acquittal of Trayvon Martin's mm -hmm. murder, the novelist Jasmine Ward, um, who's won the National Book Award twice, I think, mm -hmm. maybe the only novelist to have that yeah. distinction, invited um, a number of us from black Twitter who she felt um, affinity with to write essays um, to speak to that moment mm -hmm. of Black Lives Matter in, in an anthology called uh, The Fire This Time. And I immediately thought, because of the resonance with Baldwin, that I should use that construction and write a letter to my, to my mm -hmm. children. Yes. But at the time, they were only two and four years old, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what kind of language mm -hmm. to use around um, safety or the conversation, as we call it, as the parents of black children, how to 
protect yourselves um, against the police, the insanity and the absurdity of that conversation. I, I didn't, I wasn't able to construct my essay for that volume as a letter because they were so little and yeah. I didn't know, I didn't know what to say yet, but one thing I loved reading your letter um, was the joy piece, was mm -hmm. like, well, this isn't, this isn't merely a letter about how to inoculate yourselves or protect yourselves against um, danger. And it wasn't merely um, a letter about negative predictions, but rather it felt much more to me about, yeah, the tradition and the joy and the abundance mm -hmm. and the people from which they come and that they spring. Yeah. But your, your piece in that volume, which I loved, <laughs> you. and you, it's, you, you move through space with the kids, mm -hmm. and you talk about the way that space is decorated, the language, right, the graffiti, and, and that actually to me is very, you know, there's a, there's a family resemblance mm -hmm. to what you did there and what I was trying to do, because it's, you're present with your children, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if that's, and I, I do think there's something actually quite unusual for those types of stories to emerge from black mothers in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and another one of the things, as I was writing this book, I reflected on seeing Jasmine Ward at the Mississippi Book Festival with her daughter, and they were signing books together. Mm -hmm. And it, again, it, you know, this, this, that, um, the beauty of that relationship, those relationships, uh, doesn't come into these conversations nearly um, enough, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I also really valued the way you structured the book. Mm -hmm. It's in three parts. Yes. The first part is called Fear. The second part is called Fly. And the third and final part is called Fortune. Yes, which is both a riff on Richard Wright's Native Son and Ta-Nehisi Coates' Between the World and Me, mm -hmm. which have um, fear, f what is it? It's um, fear, <coughs> flight, and fate mm -hmm. for each of them. And so there's, um, for me, you know, for in those works, flight is about fugitivity, which, and the idea of, of sort of running in the face of danger which I think is a, a, a really intensive emotional reality um, for black boys and men. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it is in part sort of my, it's being a mother that I wanted, and it's also sort of under the tutelage of Toni Morrison that I wanted to talk about them taking flight mm -hmm. and imagining what does it mean to, to fly mm -hmm. instead of not just as a fugitive, but actually to take to the air, to be expansive. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to think about fortune in terms of that tradition to draw, not as about wealth or status or accumulation, but about having this extraordinary tradition to draw upon that notwithstanding um, the depth of inequality, there is there's something really, really abundant and beautiful that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really loved in the fortune piece the spirituality of it, the, the mm -hmm. element of um, the spirit mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. permeated that whole section, mm -hmm. even in its um, indecision. Yeah. I also felt yeah, like this book was an autobiography of a mother, mm -hmm. that a part of it is wanting your sons to know who you are and who made you. Yeah. Um, and in the ways that we, especially as mothers who are also academics and writers, can be a little unknowable to our children, mm -hmm. um, because a lot of the time that we spend is internal or, 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 or at our desks writing. Yeah. Um, it felt to me like part of the project was also wanting to let them in even a little more about yeah. your private um, mm -hmm. space and interior life and spiritual realm. Well, the full disclosure, the first version I turned in, my editor was like, you're nowhere in this book. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I said, oh. And it is, but I do think it's the, yeah, there's a, there's both sort of what we do, but also a practice of kind of self-effacement and because identity is, you know, you're supposed to be of service primarily to your children. And so after that was asked, then I actually really started to think about the ways in which I don't allow my children to fully witness me and try to change some of that mm -hmm. as I was writing mm -hmm. in the way that I interact with them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. <laughs> Maybe you could share a little more. You just mentioned your editor and an initial response that she had to the an earlier draft. Yeah. 
But um, you mentioned in the afterward that in fact she's the one who invited you to write this book. Yeah, I, I mean, so I, um, I write about my kids on Facebook all the time. Mm -hmm. And so she said, why don't you, you know, I had just, I had just written a biography of Lorraine Hansberry with her. And she said, have you thought about writing a book to your children? And I said, not really, but you know, I'll try it out. That's sort of, that seems interesting. And I, initially I, I actually it did, I think both her assumption and mine was that it would be more humorous because I, I tell a lot of the kind of absurd stories that are part of parenting um, mm -hmm. all the time. And then, you know, the question of what, what it is that I want to give them was crystallized for me and, um, and also a real worry or a real concern that I've had since they were born, which is this, this sort of tensions between the desire to protect and the desire for them to be fully human. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a fundamental tension that if we are holding them like this all the time, it's impossible for them to become them, their full selves. And so that sort of like became sort of at the center of, of what I was trying to, to do. And um, yeah. Imani just shared uh, before we entered the room that her older son, who is 16, um, that's Freeman? Yes. Was just starting to learn to drive today. And that her, her younger son, that's Isa, who's 13, was very fearful for him. Yes. So, he, so as I was leaving to come here, Isa was weeping. And he's like, this is just so dangerous. I can't believe you're letting him do this. Right? Um, but that's all. So, one, you know, it broke my heart, and also it was good that he expressed what I had was holding inside. <laughs> which, um, but it's also, I think, for me, it was another one of those moments to reflect on sort of the kind of child rearing that I've tried to do. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, to to actually very deliberately from they, the time they were small, to not say the thing that's in the bed. Why are you crying? What is this about? This is not something to cry over, right? But actually to witness what's their experience. Like those, trying to be deliberate in that way is hard because that means that you have to deal with, when you, have, when you deal with the full humanity of children, it, it's emotionally, you know, it's like the saying, you're only ever as happy as your saddest child, mm -hmm. right? The full, like, and so I think, Oftentimes, adults try to push it away, yeah. and so it's it's hard. But I think it's so rewarding because he was he just was like he, he's my brother. Like he can't drive a you know a, a, a two ton vehicle or whatever. However much they I don't know anything about cars, so that could have been completely absurd. I just said, but you know, and I and I I like that that he has that depth of feeling mm -hmm. for his brother. Yeah. yeah. Um. There's a section of the book I wanted to ask you to read okay. to give the, um, the audience a taste and also so we can dissect it a little more. It was very meaningful to me as um, mother of black children to hear this, this section. This is from the first section, um, page 10. It's, it starts, mm -hmm. um, Yes, I mean, as babies. Yep. And then maybe, is it too much to have you read to the, to the end of page 12? Oh, yes. You could recite that. the blues. Okay. Please. Thank you. I mean, as babies, you smelled of honey and powder. Your eyes glisten. Your smiles are sweet. Everybody loves you. How could they not? You are clever and kind boys and beautiful. I mean, you are truly beautiful, but you're also beautiful in the way people like to look at beautiful. And your language is so crisp. Listen to those black boys who know all of those vocabulary words. And still they pick, okay, smart but aggressive, distracted, distracting, too mobile, too slow, too fast, inattentive. Why are you still in the bathroom? It takes you too long to pee. It takes you too long to remember this algorithm, this table. You hold the pencil too tight. You do not hold it tightly enough. The words come out more gray than black. You are just too black, sniping. You should have said something when that other kid said something racist exactly then in that moment 
when your world was spinning. You judged the child who said something racist too harshly afterwards as you reconstituted. They didn't mean it. You cannot defend yourself. You should not have defended yourself. You are not allowed to defend yourself. You keep moving too much. You talk too much. You don't share enough in class. Stop taking up for other people. You do not tell the truth. They cannot handle it when you tell them the truths about themselves. So many little vicious things, so many big things. You are second generation integrators. So I went through it too, not incessantly, but enough to keep me from speaking in school for several years of my, own ad of my adolescence. A mocking teacher who either grimaces at you or gives you a cruel smile so covert as to claim constant innocence or one who simply cannot hear or see you. That's a strange and harrowing vulnerability. It makes you stoic when it is you. When it is your child, it is torture. And I am charged with holding back the torrent of my rage. I do it for you. I betray you so that the full fury of white supremacy with a currency of tears and accusations of insane black hypersensitive rage doesn't come down on you. I sin in order for you to survive. As Emily Dickinson said, I try to tell the truth, but only tell it slant. And I am ashamed of that because the right thing to do, objectively speaking, would be to bless them all out, call them everything but a child of God, offer them the pages and pages of evidence. I have studies and documents and histories and examples, and I could drown them in their own indecency. Racism is in every step and every breath we take. It has been proven <coughs> over and over again, but I don't most times, so that my love does not provide an excuse for more of their venom. Instead, I teach you to read well. I teach you second sight, the word and also its meaning, the testament and the content. This is what is happening, I say. This is what they do. At first, you are, sus you are suspicious. My lessons are different from the official ones taught in every school. Everybody is friends, everybody smiles, everybody knows racism is bad. Nobody is racist because nobody is the Ku Klux Klan around here. And the Ku Klux Klan is economically disenfranchised. Feel bad for them. And remember, if anyone might, white makes a mistake, they are innocent. How dare you think otherwise? Trust me, says the wolf with its canines gleaming. It is a threat, not an appeal. Black lives matter, brown lives matter, lives in all the shapes they revile, those matter too. There are deaths weekly, children are stolen, children are disappeared. We mourn, we rage, and then beyond the tragedies you know have something to do with you are the superseded things. In the stuff you are supposed to wipe off the corners of your mouth, slights, shoves, pulled close to the body pocketbooks, questions, never ending questions about your abilities, and quests to prove your inabilities. Resentment accrues when they fail, but they say you are the one with a bad attitude. Eventually you learn most of the cries of innocence are bullshit, that you are always under the watchman's eye, always presumed guilty no matter how many smiles they give you. And I am sorry and proud at once. You have begun to understand your native land. The sacrament of this nation has become paper thin life after the ugliest deaths haunting and in the flesh. Perhaps we should bar mitzvah black American boys at 11. The book of Moses for which you are principally responsible would be Exodus. You would recite the blues over and over until it is a moan, a growl, a mantra. Thank you so much for reading that passage. It's, it's just beautiful. Thank you. It's hard. Yeah. yeah I, I was wondering if you'd choke up reading it. I, I choked up hearing you read it because as I shared with you right before coming into the room, I, I, I was so grateful to read this passage this weekend after a moment where my son was barked at by a white woman for walking too closely to him in a crowded space. Mm -hmm. And I was so filled with rage at her at that moment, not just for that moment, but for all the moments that my mm -hmm. son, who's only eight, um, yeah. has, has already endured, and, and not just from strangers on the street who feel he's too aggressive or too much or too wild or too close, but from his teachers who are supposed to be rearing him, that he's too um, questioning of authority or, mm -hmm. too, or too wild or too much, right? Mm -hmm. um, too aggressive, too this, too that, from, from before kindergarten. Yes. Um, 
So the description you had, not only of you know, the weight of that for, for a child, but also the rage of that for a mother. Um, when it is your child, it is torture. Um, just it felt so affirming to read that, that even though it's painful, I felt very grateful that you wrote this. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I talked about your book yesterday also with a friend. Um, my children do capoeira. It's a Brazilian martial art in the Bronx. And um, I was taught, and there's a little girl, Anandi, who does it too. And I was talking to her mother. I say, how's Anandi doing in kindergarten? Because um, she started out at a private school. She's midway through kindergarten this year. And um, Anandi's mother, uh, she's sharing stories like this. You know, mm -hmm. well, she's only one of two black children in the class. She's enduring kids touching her hair, kids saying things. I don't know if it's a safe space for her. I want her to have that education. But even for me, when I walk into that space where we were required to have um, IDs, uh, they gave me an ID with like the picture of the other black mom. Of course. <laughs> and, then, and, and then they told me I was wrong when I said that wasn't my face. <laughs> we're laughing, but. It's right. But it's I'll. Present. Right. But, it, but it's absurd, and it's, it's a casual kind of evil mm -hmm. that um, I really appreciated you describing at great length in here as well. And um, when she said that to me about, you, you, you know, it, and it's not just the, the badge, but she's, you know, like, they're always calling me the other black mother's name and vice versa. And, and they don't understand when we get as upset as we do. Like, it's, it's an innocent mistake, but... It doesn't feel so innocent when right. this has happened every day. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you have a description of that mm -hmm. in here um, that I just love. You, you also take a lot of care in this book to qualify the danger that your particular children face mm -hmm. um, in their privilege, but, but still mm -hmm. a position of being at risk. And I wonder if you could walk us through that a little yeah. bit. Well, yeah, because you know one of the things I, I am aware of I try to be very diligent about is um, I sometimes am worried that those that those of us who are relatively privileged, whether it's class or education or combination, uh, get sort of overrepresented in stories or interpretations of what it means to be black, mm -hmm. right? And so I wanted to also acknowledge that there are lots of kind of um, not just opportunities and experiences, but safeguards that I can put up for my children that are not broadly available um, without sort of investing, because it's not this, you know, like, you know, I, I say police kill middle class black kids too. Mm -hmm. Right? That's actually not, and so I don't want to be sort of fictionalized and greet this fantasy that being um, middle class somehow gets you out of the, the, the um, violence of American racism. It, there are fewer encounters with it. That's mm -hmm. the distinction. Um, um, but I also, it's really important for me in rearing them with values that they're not invested in distinguishing themselves from the large, greater body of humanity, in particular, other black folks. I mean, so part of that is I want them to understand these are your people. Mm -hmm. even if things are at various moments a little bit easier for you. Mm -hmm. um, and that you have to know that also because you will need your people. Mm -hmm. right? um, and I think that can also be a sort of delusion that sometimes um, those of us with a little bit of privilege mm -hmm. have that, <laughs> that that won't. And I, one of the things, one of the stories I um, tell is about, and I thought about it because of the misidentification thing at my last job, um, I was frequently misconfused with the one other black faculty member. But also, when I'd leave campus, just a block away, no one would recognize me. Right? Like, and so I would say hi to colleagues who I was just in a meeting with, and they would not, you know, all the time. Right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Which was, I mean, just think, you know, levels of, of awkwardness where you have to be like, I mean, I, like, my office is two doors down from yours, like for the past six years. Um, um, uh, wait, I was, oh gosh, I lost my train of thought. It was something about Camden. It'll come back maybe, but, but yeah, so that, that that's, 
to also part of what I was also trying to, oh, this is where it was. So trying to, I, it's important to say to my children, knowing that they're experienced, I experienced this. This is not going to go away, mm -hmm. given the space that you navigate. But also, in that context, the friends that I had at work were, was overwhelmingly the custodial staff mm -hmm. who advocated for me, who would tell me when people were talking about me behind my back, because mm -hmm. people act as though they're invisible, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, but also having a sense of camaraderie, like having a sense of people who care about you where you are every single day. And so it's important to me that they understand that that's also a really important part of our tradition. Mm -hmm. you know, so. You're reminding me, um, I'm talking about befriending custodial staff of a project at Princeton. Wasn't there recently? Oh, yes, Maybe Mario you could Moore. speak about that. Yeah, so um, there's an artist who's been in residence. He's from Detroit. His name is Mario Moore. There's articles about him all over at this, at this point. But also, if you get to the um, Princeton Art Museum, he has pieces up there. And it's really extraordinary. So he's done these large-scale portraits of staff at Princeton. All uh, African American staff, security guards, custodial staff, um, uh, people who work in the kitchens, uh, many of whom have multi generational relationships with Princeton University, but are often treated as though they are not part of the institution or the community. And really, you know, sort of in the in these just breathtaking portraits, kind of rearticulating what Princeton is, mm. right, and making an assertion about you know, who matters, and it, um, I, I went to his studio, and one of them where he was there for fir the first couple of weeks, and was completely um, blown away by uh, what it meant to have, like, a, a fuller witness, you know, so, right, so Princeton is, was called the Southern Ivy, and you grew up in Princeton, so you can <laughs> speak to the, but, you know, it was where um, it, you know, there was a slave auction near my office in the 19th century. New Jersey has an unusual history with slavery longer than most of its, um, you know, other other states in the in the region. And in many ways, Baldwin talked about going to Princeton, and that has his first Southern experience mm -hmm. when he visited Orange Theory, <laughs> and so to visit, right, and being put out of kicked out of a, a, a diner, um, and throwing a glass at the wall and having to run away or fear for his safety in the 50s. Um, and so it is a big, yeah, it's a, it's a big deal to tell the story of the university differently yeah. even today. That project, and I think they're, they're glorious paintings, mm -hmm. and maybe in oil even, they're just, yes. the, the project is really to glorify these people that mm -hmm. may be invisible to yeah. many, but it felt actually this was a big piece of this book too mm -hmm. in your letter to your sons about um, who to understand as being in kinship with yes. at all registers of black experience. Absolutely. It seemed really crucial to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, the last time that I was in Imani's presence was at the retirement party of my father, who was um, for 30 years a, a professor of religious history, African-American religious history at Princeton. And I grew up in that town. Mm -hmm. um, is part of a mixed race family, mm -hmm. a predominantly white town, an intellectually material privileged place. Um, but always hearing as like a, a white passing little girl, mm -hmm. uh, um, often hearing comments that were so injurious like to my mm -hmm. soul yeah. from other little often children who were uh, my, my supposedly my friends along the lines of things like, you know, why'd you invite Bridget to your birthday party? Don't you know she's black? <laughs> <laughs> don't you know I am? Right, well, right. Like, clearly you don't. Yeah, that's right. yeah. um, so these moments of, um, uh, again, feeling like uh, this is the beginning of the rage, right, that I'm talking about as a mother even coming out, this like, okay, having to swallow that or make choices about when to confront it mm -hmm. um, uh, can make one ill over a lifetime. Absolutely. I made a calculated choice as, um, as an adult to... Um, to live in brown and black spaces, to teach and to and to eventually parent in them, yeah. um, and I one thing that I've traded for the kind of comfort of being around brown and black people and raising my children amongst them is um, environmental 
safety yes. in, in so far as like, okay, there's a level of, of, of comfort or ease of not feeling like, okay, my child might not have to hear things like that necessarily. But we live um, in a very polluted environment. Yeah. We live uh, in a place where one third of the children have asthma and my children have asthma. Mm -hmm. um, you had a passage in here about asthma being a feature of black life that resonated with me, and it's a new feature of, of my family life, actually. Yeah. I've now got it, too. Um, but in thinking about this, this title was so, so resonant, mm -hmm. breathe, yeah. being um, something, something we think of with uh, the echo with the Black Lives Matter movement, I yeah. can't breathe, yes. hands up. Um, but also, I like this as like a um, like an imperative. Yes, that's like yeah. breathe. We yes. want you to be able to, to breathe. Mm -hmm. But it's it, it is it's res, it's a form of resistance. I mean, there's so much that is um, choking, and so and I want my children. I want all of us to take up air and space, right? Even when it's Labored. I mean, I was thinking, it, and it's interesting because I, um, I actually wasn't <coughs> consciously thinking about Eric Garner when I titled it, I, but I was very consciously thinking about asthma. Mm. Um, and I was thinking about it in relationship to, you know, so the form, I was born in 1972, so hip hop is the form of music that I came of age on, that the form of music, a form of music that is so intensely about breath control. Mm -hmm in a context in which so many of us struggle to breathe, I thought it's just this sort of extraordinary metaphor for what it means to try to make a way as a black person in this society. And so that was what, but again, the, you know, the examples of, of um, you know, I've had, I, so one of the things we were talking about um, in the back that is related is that, so the, the, I, w I was born in Birmingham, Alabama, which was the most polluted city in the country in 1972, right? So people talk about Birmingham in terms of the 16th Street Baptist Church, which is a really important, but it also is a steel, it's a coal mill town. It's a coal town and a steel town. And so there's pollutants everywhere to this day. They've had various periods of trying, and virtually everyone in my family has chronic diseases, me included. And so, you know, to think about um, and, and there's a lot of asthma in my family as a result, particularly for the people who have stayed in Alabama, which is basically <laughs> everybody besides me and like two other people. But, you know, to think about um, broadly, right, the ways in which all of this seeps into the body. Um, and there's a tendency, and this is what part of why I so um, deeply appreciate the way that you're writing about the about climate, because sometimes people are like, well, we're think of us as like kind of miners canaries, right? Like we, you know, when you're in the more, when you're, you know, black folks, Latinx folks are the most vulnerable, but everybody's going to be affected by this, right? And it's almost becomes the argument is you should care because it's coming for you too, as opposed to I, you know, what your work does so beautifully is that it moves through what this means in a life, right? And that it is no less valuable an endeavor to talk about the, what this means for those of us who are most vulnerably situated. The, the value of the conversation is not that it's coming for someone in the suburbs, it's that this is what existence is now, and it is, and there's a moral imperative, I think. You know, you, you bring children into the world and then you have to fight for them. You have to fight for their future, right? And that's not just an individual enterprise, right? That's for their collective, right? And this is a piece of it, right? And I feel like also because as I'm fighting for them, I'm also navigating the vulnerability of my own body mm -hmm. because of the world that was that has been made and that is being sustained. Right. Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit yeah. more about the moment, their moment, yeah. right? Your kids are a little bit older than mine, yeah. but um, my children were born during 
Obama's era. Mm -hmm. Your children were little during that time. Yeah. Um, the optimism of that time has totally flipped. Yes. And um, to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. So what, I mean, let's talk a little bit about their moment and um, mothering in this moment, what we want. I'd like to know what you want for your, for yeah. your sons um, that you didn't get, what mm. you want for them that you did get, yeah, and what you want for them given the moment they're coming up in. Yeah. I mean, so one of, there's two, two events that stand out in my head as the, sort of that transition. So when the night that, um, President Obama won. <laughs> my older son, who was then five, said, he stood up and he said, my teacher is black, my mayor is black, and my president is black. <laughs> <laughs> right? In contrast, my younger son, then, the night that Trump won, early in the evening, I mean, there were, were uh, the, no, there, were no, there was no place in the country where the polls were closed and he started, my younger son started weeping and he was like, he's gonna win. And it was, and it was sort of, it was complicated because his father actually had an election that night, so it was actually a campaign party and he's like weeping even though his dad, but, and everybody said, no, 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 this is just, and he was, like there was something that he felt a terror, and so, you know, they're only three years apart and but each of these kind of these definitive um, moments, I, I do think that the thing that I feel like I I had um, that I want to impart, which is hard to do now, but I was very aware of being a movement child, mm -hmm. and that the idea of standing shoulder to shoulder with other people was in order to build a more just society was part of what it meant to be a good human being. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, and there's a, there is um, a comfort. There's also, there's also a lot of fear, and I talk to other people about, you know, who are around my age about movement baby fear. Like, I used mm -hmm. to have plans for how I was going to try to escape from prison when I, was, mm -hmm. when I grew up. I mean, literally, right? Because um, I, I thought, you know, amazing people were taken to jail, right? That was my conception of the world, right? And so, um, so there was fear, but there also was a sense of collective purpose that, that made me feel, if not hopeful, but like life was me. And so I want them to, to feel that. I'm not nearly as good, I think, imparting it as my parents were, in part mm -hmm. because I'm, you know, sitting in a university all the time mm -hmm. instead of, you know, out shoulder to shoulder. And it's all, you know, so, and the world is so different. Um, I want them to, but I, I keep talking, this is a long way to answer this question, but I keep talking about imagination um, because I feel like I have a lot to share with them. I think we all do, but I also feel a, a kind of humility about, what we haven't been able to figure out. And I do think that the imagination that young people have is really essential and sort of something about how to interact with them in a way that reflects the humility that those of us who are older ought to have such that they have can invest in their imaginations to try to solve mm -hmm. some of this. Mm -hmm. You know, to not always be like, that's not going to work. That's, you know, that's not the way to do that. But to actually say, well, here's what history and my experience and this person's experience. So I took them to the um, 55th anniversary of, of SNCC in Mississippi. We're, we're going back to the when this, the 60th this spring mm -hmm. to learn and listen, but also to try to be inspired by people who were not much older than they were and led a social revolution. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, in my writing about, um, my recent writing about climate change, I've been trying to make that connection between yeah. the civil rights movement and freedom struggle and um, the efforts we need to actually be throwing ourselves into together now um, collectively. At the same time that I'm becoming more active, um, mm. my kids, who as I mentioned are quite young, 
uh, when I try to drag them to a climate march, for example, and there's a lot of people and they're afraid and they're telling me, yeah. this is too much for me, I also have, feel I have to listen to that. Yeah, well that's <laughs> what I, I mean, we, with what happened with Easter, you know, yeah. we were going to a lot of protests, um, Troy Davis, Trayvon Mark, I mean, you know, on and on, and he, it just got to be too much for him. And so, we had to sort of start to try to think about engaging differently mm -hmm. because uh, he was just constantly thinking about, he stopped eating chicken at one point and I was like, you know, why are you, well, why don't, and he had seen some document, he said they just kill chickens the way they do black people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it was a wake up call for me of how incredible, and it, how inundated our kids are with our concern and sort of, yeah, so I felt like, okay, I have to be, like you're saying, you have to be responsive to that too because, you know, you can't fight 24-7. Mm. You have to be human, you know. And so, yeah. deserve a childhood too. Yes, <laughs> about that, you know. <laughs> um, would you mind reading this? Uh, bottom of 15, something distinct has happened in your time. Okay. I also loved your expression, just that paragraph, it ends on the top of 16. Okay. <coughs> something distinct has happened in your time. It is the product of camera phones, the diminishing whiteness of America, the backlash against a black presidency, the persistence of American racism, the money-making weapons industry, the value added from murder and police dossiers, the law and order policing, the epistrophe of our era, hands up, don't shoot, can't breathe, can't run, can't play, can't drive, can't sleep, can't lose your mind unless you are ready to lose your life, dead, dead, dead. We wail and cry, how many pietas, we protest their deaths, we protest for our lives. Yeah. I loved that paragraph. Further on, further on, you have a, another couple lines that I underscored because they really struck me. There are fingers itching to have a reason to cage or even slaughter you. My God, what hate for beauty this world breeds. They say they are afraid. I do not believe it is fear. It is bloodlust. Yeah, there are a lot of... Um, yeah. There are a lot of moments in this book like that one, mm -hmm. um, moments of precise accusation. Yeah. Um, remind me what it was that your mother told you to say and respond, or to feel, or to uh, act. So my, yes, so growing up, my mother used to say when I would tell her stories about um, encountering racism, she would say, render them invisible. And I'd be like, I can't. I'm talking to somebody, like they're not invisible. Mm -hmm. But what she meant was about a, a disposition towards mm -hmm. um, that, that gaze mm -hmm. that is absolute refusal. Mm -hmm. And it, for her, it obvious, it, you know, it, um, it was essential to make it through, you know, Jim Crow, Alabama, when it was in Birmingham, was known as Birmingham. You know, to go to 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 go to New Orleans and be a person who integrated uh, a, a university, one of eight black students on the campus. Um, that she went over to Xavier to hang out with your dad because there were more than other black people because they were black. But you know that, and then all of the movement work that followed. You had to be able to engage in some degree of disassociation mm -hmm. to not be broken. Mm -hmm. Render them invisible. So, yeah. How, how, do, how do you do that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, maybe yeah. I'm asking you like as a little sister, but also as a mother, a co-mother. Yeah. How do you teach your children to do that when? Well, I think it is, you know, I, there's a, there's a, I was telling the story yesterday, actually, because I went to a high school in um, Concord, Massachusetts, where it was common to walk around on the streets and have people yell slurs at us, right, in quote-unquote liberal Massachusetts um, in the 80s. And 
And um, one of the things that would frequently happen is if I was with my friends, they would cry. And I'd be like, what are you crying for? And they were hurt. And whatever, whatever had been instilled in me by my family, I was very certain that no one who called me a slur was correct. Mm -hmm. Right? Something was wrong with them. Mm -hmm. Right? And so they became these sort of strange objects. I would be fearful sometimes for my safety, but not internalizing. And I think that's a discipline. I don't think that's just, it's not something that you can just say. Right? And so one of the things I also say in the book is that you also have to be prepared for the moments when it's all too much and you have to be okay with retreating mm -hmm. and tending to yourself. And, right? So that, you know, you, I, you know I, so I don't want anybody to pretend that nothing, you know, we sort of like nothing ever hurts, but that, you know, you, you, um, <coughs> there's almost like a, I think the development, a discipline of developing a kind of force field that only comes through understanding what's actually going on. Yeah. Right? You, you cannot have, you can't get there unless you actually understand the way the society has been structured and mm -hmm. why things are the way they are. So when my kids were little and we would drive through um, North Philly and I would say, you know, what do you notice? Right? And they'd say, there's more potholes, there's trash on the street. And I'd say, let me explain why. Right? Because if you don't explain why, then people say things like black people care less about their neighborhoods, black people don't, you know, all these narratives just creep in. Mm -hmm. Right? So you have to say, oh, this is because people don't, because of racism, trash doesn't get picked up as frequently because, you know, there's not a sense of a public good. People think because you're poor, you're not supposed to have a, a nice place to live. I mean, the, you know, to sort of really try to teach why the way the world is the way that it is. Otherwise, it, I don't know how you avoid internalizing um, the ideas. And we have to keep doing it for ourselves. Yeah, that's so helpful. Thank you. That render them Thank invisible you. is not equal to pretend it isn't happening, right. but rather understand the insanity um, and the structural reasons behind it. Yeah. Understand that it is insanity. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I worry that white people are irredeemable, and it scares me. Yeah. Page 71. Say more. Yeah, there's a couple of sentences that really bother people, and that's one of them. Um, it scares me. It scares me because I don't want to believe it. I don't want to think that these 400 years have been in vain of struggle. But I, I will say 2016 made me, you know, I, so you, <laughs> I thought, so my mother ra was raised in a white nationalist state and now she has to be back there again. And her, someone whose entire life has been spent in some degree of struggle or another. I just, you know, and it's the generations after generation, you mean we have to have this conversation again? And so I sort of feel like there's a, you know, there's nothing, I don't know what else black people, I mean, it, it's, I don't know what else black people can, can be expected to do to try to redeem this nation. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's like, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is just a failed project, right? And so, <laughs> and that's the, feel, that's the feeling. You know, so I sort of, so I don't want to think that way because I want the investment to have been worth it. Mm. And I want, a, I want a, a, a more humane, just society. I do love the country, notwithstanding the evil that it's done, because it's mine, right, to echo Baldwin. And so I guess for me, I say that to my kids on a certain level because I'm like, y'all going to have to convince me, mm. right, like that this something, because, and I mean, I, and I don't mean, I'm always worried because I don't, even when I feel hopeless, I don't think hopeless is an appropriate emotion to have if you're a parent mm -hmm. or an educator. So you have to practice, you have to labor to create hope, mm. right? But I also felt like I have to be honest. I don't know. You know I just don't, I don't know. This is a, a, back to Baldwin, it's just a distinction I felt too that he was known um, 
for writing beautifully about the black experience in mm -hmm. ways that affirmed it, but also kind of to explain it to a white audience. Yeah. And your book, it really felt to me like a letter to your sons. Yeah. You know, for them. Mm -hmm. Where you had rendered that other audience invisible to yourself almost. Right. Well, Perhaps. I guess, not, that, not that this is not a book that white yeah. readers could learn from, but it, that wasn't They're not purpose. the center. No. They're not the center. Your sons are the center. That's right. And I do think that it's important for white people to experience being witnesses and not the center. I know we're... Um, yeah, we're close to time, but I wanted to, to conclude by asking you what's next. This is your sixth book? Sixth? Yeah. I mean, over a lifetime. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, That's a lot of books. So <laughs> I'm writing this book about the South, which is why all those like, little references came up, because um, my mind is in the region. And the basic idea is that you know, it's a region that's often seen as this kind of weird other, all the sins of the nation are projected on it, like all the bad stuff happens there. But in many ways, this country has always pivoted around the region. Mm -hmm. Since, you know, it's the region where the wealth of the nation was built. It's the region that kind of holds the nation hostage politically. Mm -hmm. And it's the region that I think if we're going to figure this out, it's going to have to be rooted there. Mm -hmm. And so that's... And That's what I'm working it's on. It's the region also to you that feels like home. It's my home. Yeah. It's home. Yeah. I can't wait to read it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>Good. Um, so I just wanted to know, at what point during the writing process did your children see this book, mm -hmm. read it? Yeah. How old were they, and uh, what were their reactions? So, um, so it's sort of it's like piecemeal. So I was right. I wrote most of it when I was we were in living in Japan in the summer of 2018. Um, and so it was like kind of an iterative process because I allowed them to veto any stories they didn't want in the book. And so I would say, can I say this? And sometimes they'd say no. <laughs> Issa is now like, I can't believe you didn't put my Instagram handle in it because I would have so many followers. <laughs> Which is not actually necessarily true, but whatever. Um, um, so, and then they read sections of it, but it's complicated by the fact that I've been writing them letters since they were very young. So there are actual pieces from real letters that I wrote them. Like I say real letters because, you know, it's not the performative act of writing a book, right? And so um, it's only this year that my older son actually just read the whole thing from start to finish. Um, and it's not, you know, it's so, fam like, it really is our relationship. So it's, there's nothing sort of particularly interesting to him about, you know, he's like, he's like, oh, it's good. I like your stream of consciousness style. Um, he's like, you really like the word distended? And I was like, yeah, I like that word. You know, so it's, what, one thing, though, that was really interesting, he applied for, he had, when he hadn't read it, he applied for a summer program that he went to last summer. And he wrote about um, Troy Davis as part of his application. And his essay was virtually identical to what I wrote in the book, not having seen it, about our experience with Troy Davis's execution. And that was really striking to me. I mean, we are very similar, but also that we read that moment in such similar ways. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Doreen. You're writing from a mother's perspective, and I'm curious to know if you spoke to any African-American males to get their perspective to um, enhance your letter or the message you could give to your sons. 
Um, so it's interesting, not, not in terms of the act of writing, but of course many of the writers who directly influenced me and then also the men in my family and in their families, whether, you know, their father, my uncles, my father passed away but years ago and it was not African American, but the, the, there are all these sort of men in their world who make an appearance in the book. Um, and I also, of, of a wide variety, and I talk to them about, in the book, about witnessing a very wide variety of ways of being a black boy and man, because I think that's really important, um, that there isn't a narrow conception of what is an acceptable way to be a, a black man. But I, but I also do think that there, there's a lot more um, sort of man-boy kind of public discourse than there is, you know, woman-boy, woman-child, right? And, and I think that it was, for me, it was important to open up some of that space, not as a, not as a rejection of that, but because I think, you know, there's a way in which um, black mother in partic motherhood in particular has a tendency to either be treated as this, like, you know, long-suffering, sacrificial black mother who does everything for the child, or fails, right? right? Those are the two options, or not good, right? <laughs> so it's like you have to be nothing or you're not good, right? And I wanted to sort of do something, I wanted to do something different because it is also important to me that my children become people who can fully witness women in their lives, however, whatever the relationship it is, but to, feel, to not feel as though that's a kind of less significant set of experiences or kind of humanity. Hello. Hi. My name is Fadi Nassar Hayat. First of all, I just want to thank you for um, this piece. I um, just uh, downloaded, I cheat, I download a lot of books, so I'll start listening to it on my way out of here. Thank you. And, um, you know, I'm listening to your words, and, you know, immediately I started thinking about Tatanisi's coats. And uh, even um, 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 how to be anti-racist, yes. and you know, thinking of your words in those contexts, and you know, appreciating um, this assistance that you're giving so many of us who are. I have me and my wife. We have two young boys as well, mm -hmm. eight and six year old, and living yeah. here. And I actually just told my wife today, like she's like, he won't go sit over there. He won't go fit in. And I said, you know, but look at the energy that he's trying to avoid. Yeah. You know, like he, you know, I, we engage in this exact same thing where we've been pulling back from him because he gets it too much. Yeah. And uh, um, just literally just this week, um, one of his classmates told him, a young white girl told him, um, you know, I wish your ancestors were still slaves. <laughs> and um, the funny thing is that, you know, he reported it and so on and so forth. Right. And my wife was telling me, hey, um, you know, um, he didn't want me to talk to the teacher because when I talked to the teacher, the teacher told me he did report it, but later on during the day, he actually came and pushed the girl. Yeah. And she's like, you know, the problem is like he's gonna make it about him pushing her. Right. And oh, my but, child was suspended behind something like that. So yes, I know. But <laughs> it, it, like, sh should we expect anything different from him? Like, is right, his not push it. not the appropriate reaction to such of an uh, attack? Right. So. I, I say all this because yeah. I'm happy you eventually said the words. You know, I, I, I ask her all the time, should we just leave? Like, yeah. should we continue to engage in this process of hoping they can be the few who slip through the crack and be okay? Ooh. When there are spaces in this world that they don't have to be the exception, yeah. that they can be as amazing as they can possibly be, yeah. and this fear, this constant fear of them don't have to exist. Yeah, I mean, that's just so profound. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, I had, I, mean, I go through a litany of experience and one in which my child actually took up in defense of a black girl and punched someone who called her the N-word and my child was suspended and nothing happened to the child because he claimed he didn't do it, right? He doesn't go to that school anymore obviously, but it was a part of a series of events. And then, you know, part of the choreography becomes then the parents, I don't know how, how my child got that idea. We don't teach them any bad things about race. That's how, right? 
because if you don't talk about it, everything in the society teaches you racism, okay? And so it becomes, and I, I don't know the answer, but I know that we have to talk honestly about grappling with it. And the, I think that for me, I, I'm always like, actually black children don't, can't come through without wounds, but they can come through whole and healthy and ha but you, this, it's a wounding place. Um, and so the question becomes, you know, it's always this balancing act and overwhelmingly institutions don't address it appropriately. And then you had the other layer of the large scale educational inequality. So then the balance is, well, here's an institution that's more affirming. And then how do you address the inequality that they experience by virtue of being in this institution as opposed to being one or two in that institution? And I don't, one thing I do know is I don't know the answers, right? Is, but, I, but, I, but I think that we have to insist upon drawing attention to the reality and not swallowing it. And one of the things that I sometimes worry that we do in all kinds of spaces is, and I'm not one of these people who's like, what black people need to do this, like that's not my thing. But I do worry that sometimes we act as though um, somebody has offered us a gift to be in places that we're entitled to be. And that that, so I, you know, every time I've said to my children whether or not the schools will respond appropriately, that was an, if it's an inappropriate response, that was an inappropriate response. And I will say it to people at the school in front of them because I don't want them, again, to internalize um, uh, the message. I, I, my, um, I, I'll tell one really quick story. My younger son had an interaction with a girl who said, you know, I don't like you and I don't like you. And he said, is it because we're black? And she said, yes, I don't like black people. And he said, well, you're a racist. I think this was in first grade. And then it becomes this whole thing, right? And then, you know, it's a thing. And then the, you know, the parents say, I don't know where she got that idea. And, but they never would speak to black adults. And like, so you would walk by and it's like, you're, well, that's where she got the idea, right? And then, but also very, very self-consciously liberal people, right? Like, so, you know, always want to participate in the king ceremony and all this, right? <laughs> and I think that's, until we can actually insist upon, like, that that becomes this kind of, I mean, it's so grotesque, but it, it's why it becomes so impossible to figure out, right? Because people who are so busy patting themselves on the back are actually injuring our children, so. I'm sorry, that was long-winded and probably not helpful, but I appreciate your comment a lot. Hi. Um, I believe in living in the real world, and in that real world, to say something like, white people are irredeemable is an important thing to say. Mm -hmm. I think it needs to be said much more. I think that nearly all white people are racist, you know, and that's just reality. Mm -hmm. And it's something that the more that people look at it, the more something can be done about it, if anything can be done about it. Yeah. Um, and I have two comments. Um, so thank you for saying that in your book and here. But um, I'm, work I'm working with a student right now. I'm a teacher who um, he can read only two syllable words. He's, he's 18. He's got horrible dyslexia beyond belief. He ended up with a woman in her 20s who had a baby with him and gave it up to diapers. Mm -hmm. And he's fighting to get custody of that baby and the racist, horribly racist judge told him he could not have custody of that child unless he passes this H the HSPT standardized test, which is impossible for this kid because he can't read three syllable words. Right. And the whole school system let him get through without admitting that he can't read three syllable words. And right. I mean, when you're dealing with something as se severe, you know, there's there's mild dyslexia yes, where you can absolutely. learn and yes. you can get through college and do fine. But severe dyslexia, if you right, can't read three syllable words, you're not going to be able to read well, and you're not going to be able to pass these tests. Right. And so I'm now in the process of writing a report and going to court to try to help him get his kid. And he's a wonderfully loving, beautiful, 
really beautiful human being, and he loves his son more than anything. And he, the, the child needs him, and he needs the child. Yeah. And it's so obvious. And, you know, I mean, I'm good at fighting. I'll do the best I can do. I run, because I'm white, probably I have a good, a better chance mm -hmm. of winning than if I were black, but, um, which is good. I'm glad I have that secret weapon. Okay. But um, that's one issue yeah. that I think everybody, racism shows its head in so many ways. Absolutely. I mean, Especially that's just, in you know, I mean, yeah. it's, if this were a white kid, this never would have happened to him. Mm -hmm. Absolutely never would have happened to him. It was just an, and be, you know, the fact that he didn't get any help for yeah. all those years and ended up dropping out of school early, also a racism issue. Yeah. But that's one thing that I'm dealing with. And the other thing is, I kind of helped raise a friend of mine, a kid, the child of a friend of mine. We, I'm kind of, I'm Ann, I'm called Ann Linda. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, and he just, for all these years, I've been trying to tell him, don't buy a gun. He wanted to buy a gun. He wants to be macho and in invincible. He's in his, tw he's like 25 or something. I never keep track, but, um, and he, he finally did it. All these years, we've been all telling him, don't do it, don't do it. They don't, the police don't need an excuse to shoot you. And, and he just finally did it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, well, you know, how, how you yeah. know, he, that whole sense of invincibility, he doesn't get the real world. I mean, if he met more people like you, you know, he well, would he yeah. forget that maybe, I mean, I don't know, his parents it's are so telling the truth too, but. Yeah, really it's so, that becomes so complicated. Um, and I'm speaking as someone who, has a family full of gun owners because we're from Alabama, um, and I don't. But um, and I, it's so complicated because there's real feelings of fear and vulnerability that are usually behind that that we shouldn't discount when we're not in the position of the person feeling that vulnerability. Right. So you could say it's not it's not sort of wise given the landscape we live in, but it's a it's just hard. I think it's hard, and I think again, and the point, the, the the example you gave of um, of the court piece. I mean, one of the things I, I wish that Americans across race who are middle class and up would actually be forced to encounter what it's like to navigate social services and the court system, because it's sort of like how every time someone famous goes to prison, they become like a prison reform activist because you real. <laughs> Right, because you realize how overwhelmingly disgusting so many of these structures are. And I don't think you can actually be informed politically um, unless you physically enter the spaces. So I, I think the point is really well taken. And, the re and, and it's, so all of that, but I also think, you know, I worry even though about the logic, like not giving someone an excuse because there's no excuse necessary, right? We see people who are unarmed, black young men killed all the time. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, you know, so. I, yeah. Um, we just have time for one more question, unfortunately, back here. Um, Amani's going to be, if you haven't gotten a book, you can still get one from watching booksellers in the cafe, and she'll be signing, but um, her okay. car is coming uh, before 6 o'clock. So one more question. Okay. okay, I have a comment and a question. Okay. Uh, this summer, I went with a friend of mine. We went to uh, Boston, and we picked, like, several tours we were going to be on. And she's like, oh, my goodness, it's going to be so interesting. I'm like, it's, and she had all these expectations of the the little tours you were going to do. And I'm like, you know I'm going to be the only one there. And mm -hmm. she's like, what? And I'm like, you know I'm going to be the only one there. And we, every time we went on something, I was literally the only person of color there. Mm -hmm. And these are historic monuments, historic places. So I look at us and our communities, and I ask the question, and I don't know if you covered this in your book, why aren't we more interested in our history, in sharing our history with the country, with the world? Uh, libraries, schools, meetings, groups, it just, we're, we're not investing as, as groups to get the word out 
as much as I think we should or could, okay? And while your, your book is definitely a step in that direction in teaching our children about themselves mm -hmm. and the community and the world at large, but you can't be the only two voices, the, you know, a few authors out there who are telling this story. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Well, there are a lot, lot of authors. I mean, there's, this is actually a renaissance moment in African American literature. There's so much coming out. So I think there is, there, there are communication challenges that have everything to do with economic inequality that have to do with libraries being shut and, and defunded and librarians being fired in Philadelphia is, is where I live as an example. Um, so that these, and, and schools which don't have close relationships with the community. So I used to work at a school in Boston um, where, which was always dark because the school, the public school system had systematically decided to save money by taking out 50% of the lights. And so you walk into school and it's, it's, it's dark and the library, I never saw the library unlocked ever when I worked there. And so, you know, and this, that's, a, that's a funding issue. That's a failure of politicians to be accountable to community. It, you know, it's all those sorts of things. And in Boston, for example, there's a trail that, um, um, is Carolyn your class, Doreen? No, she was 95. Oh, okay, so who, who, this young woman from Boston created a, um, a history trail called Our Town, which it takes you through the black community in Boston that is staffed by teenagers and is this whole community-based event in the um, African Meeting House there too. So there are, so there's a lot going on, I think. So I don't think the issue is the lack of um, both effort or interest. I think the question is, how do we get rid of the impediments? So one of the things is, for example, most people don't know that in most cities, the public library will have passes to museums, right? And so if you think I can't afford to go to the museum and don't know that you could go to the library and get a pass to go to the museum for we free. Have we have that. Right. So it things, I think, so I think the question that you're asking is a good one because it becomes how do we make this knowledge broadly accessible, right? And I'm, you know, I'm not a systems person, but I think that's really, you know, the key. How do we make it available? Yeah, I, I, that's, thank you. That's really one of the things I, I, I want to get out, get the word out to share the, the, all the parts of, of the history of this country. Uh, this is just one big story to tell. Thank, thank you so much. You.